Hello everyone, this is Mecha, and today we are going to talk about Sacred Stones and Promotion Paths. Sacred Stones, or FE8, is a game often recommended to players who are relatively new to the Fire Emblem franchise. Uh, it works well as both a first game and a bridge between the 3DS emblems and the older, more traditional ones. Uh, Fans of Awakening will recognize the interactive world map, but most of FE8 resembles FE7 and FE8, so that's why it's a great in-between game. Uh, one cool thing about Sacred Stones that is different from FE6 and FE7 is that your characters can promote into different classes. And uh, this choice can be a little bit intimidating since you can't reclass in this game unless you reload your save. There's just no way to go back on your choice. So I thought I'd make a quick guide on it as someone who's pretty familiar with Sacred Stones. Uh, this guide is intended to be used by just about anyone, whether you're like a super casual player or someone who's looking to play fast and get low turn counts, this advice will be useful to you. My goal is to make the game easier for whoever is watching this. Sometimes people will only suggest classes based on higher stat caps or whatever is best in creature campaign, but I'm going to be focusing on the main game, but I will drop some notes on creature campaign just for the sake of completeness. Of course, this is all just going to be my opinion, but you'll find very few seasoned players who disagree. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about when to promote before I talk about how to promote. Uh, generally, I am an advocate of fairly e early promotion in the GBA games. I talked about this in pitfalls, but usually delaying a unit's promotion to get more level ups results in very little long-term gain, while promoting earlier gives you a huge boost right away. Uh, let's say you have a unit that's around level 15 and they gain like 15 XP per kill or 5 if you were to promote them. So if you want to wait 2 levels to promote them, then you have to feed them around 14 kills to get them there. And with those 2 levels you'll probably not get more than 1 point in all your stats, since most non-HP growths aren't much higher than 50%. You might get lucky, but you also might get unlucky, it's all up to the RNG. But if you promote that unit instead, you'll get an immediate stat boost much larger than the RNG based one I just mentioned. Usually it's two or more in every stat, and you get to use it for an entire chapter or two more. You also get access to one or more extra weapon types, you uncap any cap stats or weapon ranks, you might get a mount to work with, or at least a point of movement, and any other benefits a promotion might give you, such as a crit bonus or a skill like Pierce. Having all these benefits earlier is usually so much better than a little bit of a stat bonus at the end. Not to mention that near the end of the game, you'll get all these legendary S-rank weapons that will obliterate monsters anyway, so your extra stats aren't even worth that much for you offensively. If you're worried about promoting early, uh, and that it will affect your creature campaign, uh, don't be. <laughs> you don't need amazing insane stats to handle endgame enemies, and the few enemies that are threatening you can take out with S-rank weapons. You can also buy stat boosters with any money you have left over to boost a couple of your units to the point where they trivialize enemies. So with that out of the way, let's get into it. Uh, I'm going to be using the introduction page on Serena's Forest, since it has all the classes and their paths in one convenient place. The Lords only have one promotion, so I don't have a whole lot to say about those. Uh, I always just promote them uh, when I get the chance at the end of chapter 16, since there's so little of the game left. And oh, you guys can see my, uh, my open office through the thing, can't you? Uh, that's funny. Anyway, um, I promote them when there's like very little of the game left uh, at the end of chapter 16 and there's like no reason to wait even any longer than they already have. If you really want to delay their promotion, do note that you can use the legendary weapons Siegmund and Sieglinde, or Sieglinde, since they are personal weapons, not S-rank weapons. So first we have the Knight category, aka all the people who promote into... Uh, let me center this right here. aka all the people who promote into uh, Cavalier or Knight. Um, also known as people who use a knight crest, but Serenus Forest ran out of uh, bandwidth apparently. So um, I guess we'll start with the smallest one, which is Amelia. Amelia can go either Cavalier or Cavalier's over here, Cavalier or Knight. And now in general, I would not recommend using Amelia at all, since she's more trouble than she's worth. But if you are using her and you're not looking to just meme, uh, you should go Cavalier. Basically, the game is asking you with this promotion, do you want to have three more movements and do you want the option to use swords, or would you rather stay at four movements and not have the ability to use swords? Uh, the knight stats are slightly better in some areas, but it's not even all of them. And cavalier is better in the two stats that help you the most, um, movement and speed. Like, knight gets a little bit of extra defense and some other very small edges, but it's like one or two points at most. Uh, the cavalier's advantages are much huger. Uh, or is it more huge? I don't even know. I can't speak English. Assuming you go Cavalier though, um, Amelia joins the likes of Franz, Ford and Kyle. And those all have to decide between Paladin and Great Knight. Now, Paladins have 8 movements, and while Great Knights only have 6, but while a Paladin can only use, quote unquote only, use swords and lances, 
Great Knights also get an axe rank to work with, and this is different from older GBA games where Paladins can use axes as well. Uh, I think the better choice here is definitely Paladin. Uh, 8 movement allows you to do so much more than 6, especially on units that can move again after trading, rescuing other tasks that aren't attacking. Uh, it gives you way more flexibility, <laughs> you'll probably hear that a lot during this thing, flexibility. So for a supposedly mobile class, like Great Knight advertises itself to be, it's actually very sluggish, since they take very heavy train penalties, but they still only have as much move as a promoted infantry class like Swordmaster. In a map like Chapter 20, they just get stuck and don't get anywhere. Paladins also take fairly heavy terrain penalties, being a mounted class, but thanks to their high move stats they can still pull through and have roughly as much movement as your um, infantry. And also, while it's not a very significant factor, Great Knights take effective damage from both horse and armor slayer weapons, while Paladins only take that from horse slaying weapons. It doesn't matter much since these enemies are rare and it's pretty easy to, disp to dispatch of them, even when you do find them, but Paladins have to deal with it less often, and when they do, they're better equipped to avoid them, thanks to their higher movement. There is only one exception here, and that might be Ford, and I'm not sure on this one. Uh, Ford is a character whose combat I think is so garbage, especially strength-wise, <laughs> that the power boost provided to him by using axes might just be significant enough to consider going Great Knight. But I still don't think it's a clear-cut choice, and if I'm using this guy, I'm probably just making him a paladin and having him rescue drop people, because Ford sucks. Uh, the other Cavaliers get by alright with the paladin class, especially friends. Kyle needs a little bit of help in the speed department, but the extra one speed from Great Knight is not going to solve this um, compared to Paladin, so honestly just go Paladin. Uh, now if you're Gilliam or a stubborn Amelia user and you're stuck with the Knight class, uh, you can still go Great Knight, <laughs> you still have a chance, or you can pick General. Now again, the General is trying to tempt you with slightly higher stats and a great shield skill, but you should definitely go Great Knight um, if it's between these two. It's less lopsided than Knight versus Cavalier, but it's still a matter of one point of movement versus a very slight statistical edge. Wow. <laughs> great Shield really isn't all that great. It's only 1% for every level you have under your belt, and after promoting to either class, you won't have much problems with durability. If you have to rely on Great Shield to save you a lot, you, you're probably fighting the wrong enemies with your general anyway, so Great Knight is the way to go here. Um, all that said, if you do want to go Great Knight Amelia, you should save yourself the Pain of the Knight class and just go through Cavalier. Uh, there's also a secret path on th for Amelia that isn't listed here. Uh, it's called Super Trainee. If you've beaten both Erika and Ephraim route, you have the option to promote her into a Recruit, uh, which again promotes into Recruit, also known as Super Recruit. And in this class, Amelia gains a mo point of movement every time she promotes, and when you promote her the second time, she gets a plus 15 crit bonus. It's mostly a novelty to see Amelia's clumsy attack animation over and over and over, <laughs> and not really worth giving up the Paladin class or all the extra weapon types, but it's pretty funny that they included it anyway. It anyway. Uh, this is a very long video, by the way, so I'm just doing this in one take to get it over with, so any mistakes, I'm just going to keep. You guys are going to have to live with it. Uh, I did script this, by the way, but I don't want to stick to just the script. That just doesn't sound natural to me. So th this might seem like a very lengthy discussion on just one path, but it encompasses a pretty large number of characters, and it's one of the more diverse classes, so a lot of the other choices are easier to explain. So the next group is a group called Fighters. Let me get them here. Oh, they don't even fit on the window. She's... Well, I guess they barely fit. So um, this group is called Fighter, even though not everyone here can become a fighter, but whatever. Uh, Naomi is the first character we'll look at. Uh, she starts as an archer, and she can go either a sniper or a ranger. Uh, this is the, probably the easiest decision in the game. Uh, ranger gets an extra point of movement, uh, only one, uh, despite the horse. Uh, a D rank in swords, and all the advantages that come with being mounted. And sniper gets um, sure strike, a skill that has a level percent chance to proc, that gives you a guaranteed hit. Five percent of the time, it will work every time. Yeah. And it's backed up by a weapon type that has no issues, no hit issues whatsoever. Yeah, you should always go Ranger. Uh, then we get to Garrick. He is a mercenary that can promote into either Ranger or Hero. And this one is much tougher, and in fact it's probably the most well-balanced promotion choice in the game. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, Garrick. Um, so, Garrick at base, he lacks two things. Uh, amount and good one to range, and Ranger gives him the former, uh, but Hero and its ability to use the hand axe gives him the latter. And the Ranger mount only has one more movement than the Hero class, so it's pretty close. And as a Hero, he's pretty tough to ferry around with other mounts since he has 15 cons, so characters like Franz, Cormag, and Seth, they can't carry him. So it's harder to work around the movement problem than it is for other characters. So basically, axes are a lot better than bows, <laughs> and as a Hero, 
Garrick is much better at clearing sections of the map on his own since he can counter mages, archers, javelins, and so on. But as a ranger, he's better at ferrying others around and reaching hard to get targets, since he has one more point of movement and access to the longbow. I think for faster playthroughs, ranger has more utility, but for an easy to use combat juggernaut, you should probably go with hero. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Uh, also, I generally promote Garrick as soon as I get him, uh, since he joins at level 10 with a hero crest in hand. His bases are good enough to get away with it, and especially as a hero, it gives him good combat advantage over all the lance users. You can wait if you want, but it doesn't really do much for him. And then I guess it's time to talk about Yax duo, um, Garcia and Ross. Uh, Ross has a very unique path, where he needs a different promotion item depending on where he goes. Um, he can go Pirate, and then he needs an Ocean Seal to promote. Or he can go Warrior, and then he needs a Hero Crest. Uh, or Fighter needs a Hero Crest. Uh, you can go Warrior either way, uh, while Hero is exclusive to the Fighter path, while Berserker is exclusive to the Pirate path. And I think Pirate and Berserker are his best two choices. There's not that many characters that can cross oceans, rivers, and, and mountains as effortlessly as these two classes, and it has a nice bit of utility. The crit bonus Berserkers get is also very good, as it can compensate for when Ross misses or doesn't double. Hero is the next best option for him, since he can use C-rank swords, including the Killing Edge, for when he can't afford to miss. Uh, whatever you do, I would stay away from Warrior, uh, as it gives him the least speed out of all the classes, and speed is really what Ross has the most trouble with. If you're using other characters who need like an Ocean Seal or a Hero Crest, that might be worth taking into consideration uh, when deciding on Ross's promotion. You only get one Hero Crest until chapter 13 or 14, depending on the route, and only one Ocean Seal at all. So if you're looking to promote, say, both Colm and Ross, you should probably take Hero Ross, so you don't need two Ocean Seals. Uh, unless you're okay with waiting for the chapter 14 Secret Shop or the chapter 15 Master Seal. And like Amelia, Ross has a secret promotion if you beat the game once on both routes. Uh, Super Journeyman, as it's known, gives uh, plus, plus 15 crit, just like a Berserker, but it can't water walk like Berserker can, and it also gives him one less speed, so it's not really worth serious consideration. Uh, Garcia cannot go pirate like Ross can, so for him it's really just between warrior and hero. And just like his son, Garcia needs all the speed he can get, so hero is the better choice for him. Getting sea swords is also just so much better than e rank and bows, I, I really don't know what they were thinking here. Uh, the only drawback I, think, I can think of for going hero for these two is that it limits their strength cap, but even at their maximum of 25 strength, they're going to twit KO pretty much everything, even during the creature campaign, and whatever they don't you can just use effective weapons against, like the dash rank weapons. So next up are the Swordsman, let's get him into view. There we go. Uh, this is in view, right? Yeah, that's pretty much in view. Okay, so uh, for Myrmidons we've got Joshua and Marisa, they start as Myrmidons, and they have the option to go either Swordmaster or Assassin. A Swordmaster gives them a plus 15 critical bonus and equal or better stats all around, while Assassin gives them the ability to f see further in the fog, pick blocks, and they get the Silencer skill. And Silencer is a skill that has a 50% chance of activating uh, whenever the Assassin gets a critical hit, and it will kill the enemy instantly regardless of their HP when it procs, and it also gives them a bit of an EXP boost. And speaking of an EXP boost, um, Assassins also gain EXP a little faster than Swordmaster due to an inbuilt uh, class bonus. So what Joshua and especially Marisa need help with the most is power. They tend to fill the twit kill enemies with their raw strength, so they're often relying on their crits to do so. And with a crit, Joshua especially is fine on the one round killing front, and the class that gives him a higher chance of doing just that is Swordmaster. A silencer proc doesn't do a whole lot for them since the crit would probably kill anyway, and even if it would help them, it's very very unreliable since Assassin doesn't have a crit boost, and even when critting it only has a 50% chance of happening. And as for lockpicking and fog of war, these are utilities you can turn to other units for, and you'd probably be better off if they did it. If you trained up Joshua and Marisa, having them spend turns in treasure chests or using torches just isn't very useful. You might as well have Renak or Colm take care of that while Joshua and Marisa fight. I'm not a huge fan of these units when it comes to their combat utility to begin with, since they lack 1-2 range or amount, but if you're going to train them only to turn them into glorified thieves, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. Now, speaking of glorified thieves, let's talk about the only thief in the game, Colm. Uh, Colm can also become an assassin, but he can also go rogue. Now, rogue is a class that wasn't in the previous TBA games, but it was in some of the other games. Um, it's meant to be more of a utility-based class, letting them open doors and chests without a lockpick. And Rogue also retains the ability to steal items while they're faster, while Assassins actually lose the ability to steal when they are promoted from Thief. Now while for Garrick, I had trouble making the call because both classes offered him something really good. For Colm, I actually have trouble deciding because I think the choice hardly matters. 
The promo, bo the promo bonuses are almost identical, and he's not going to be good at combat no matter what, since he is sword locked, low strength, and there's hardly enough locks in the game for him to run out, run out of the lockpick to begin with. So you never really need the ability to open locks without him. And um, without the lockpick, I mean. And you can also buy chest keys, so you might not even need comb to open chests. You can't buy door keys though, I'm still salty about that. So really you should go with whatever you like better. Uh, I think the rogue animation looks really stupid, so I tend to go with assassin. And now we get to my one of my favorite portions, the flyers. Let's get to the flyers. Alright, so before we get to Cormac, let's talk about uh, Pegasus Knights, uh, Vanessa and Tana. They can go either Falcon Knight, which gives e rank swords, or Wyvern Knight. Here we go. I keep forgetting to move my mouse along, but you guys can see the image anyway. Uh, so Wyvern Knight, which features the Pierce skill and a huge boost of 3 in Constitution. This is not a no-brainer, and one of the few things um, holding the Pegasus Knights... Uh, what am I reading here? Okay, yeah. Uh, three <laughs> Pierce and a huge boost of 3 in Constitution. This is not a no-brainer. One of the few things holding the Pegasus Knights back once trained is the fact that they get weighed down, especially by Javelins. The 3 com boosts might as well be a 3 speed boost, and with it they hardly get weighed down by anything, and thus they have no need for these dinky swords at all. If you really want them to go ham on a group of Axe users, you can just give him the Axe Reaver. Pierce is not reliable, but it's basically a slight crit boost, and if you're willing to fiddle a little bit with the RNG, it's a good way to kill bosses, uh, especially the very late game ones. Uh, some of them are very tanky. Uh, but even if you're not, it's still a nice occasional offensive boost. There's a couple of other statistical differences between the two, but none are big enough to talk about. Okay. Next is uh, Cormac, the Wyvern Rider. He too basically has the choice uh, between Wyvern Knight or a Sword Rank, although in his case he actually gets uh, D Swords instead of E. How sexist. Uh, this choice is also very unbalanced. Wyvern Knight gets a really big plus 3 speed bonus, while Wyvern Lord gets plus 0, and Cormac is definitely not fast enough to where he doubles everything by default. The only thing Wyvern Lord has to answer for this is plus 2 defense to Wyvern Knight's 0 plus defense, but Cormac definitely needs speed more than he needs defense. And finally, we have the Magic Tree. I wonder if this one fits onto the screen, I doubt it. Yeah, this is really huge. Okay, I'm just gonna stay at the top for now. So, um, the fact that it's so big is almost entirely Ewan's fault, by the way. Ewan? Yeah, I think it's Ewan. So I guess we'll get him out of the way first. Um, Ewan, gotta get him into view. There we go. Um, Ewan can promote into either a mage or a shaman. Some people say shaman, but I, I prefer shaman. Uh, needing a guiding ring either way to then turn into either a sage or a mage knight. Or you can turn it into Druid or a Summoner, and then there's also the Super Pupil option. So now Yuen isn't a very good unit unless you're willing to grind him very slowly, either in his joining chapter or in the tower. If you're willing to do that, then you can really go any path you want, and he'll be usable or really good depending on just how much EXP you're pouring into him. Uh, because that's what, that's just what grinding does. It eliminates um, a statistical disadvantage that Yuen might have. Now in most of Yuen's paths, he can use Anima Magic, which is nice since Thunder is a really good tome. He, he temporarily forgets how to use fire as a shaman, but he relearns it as a druid, which is pretty funny. Now, all of his promoted classes, other than uh, super trainee, have staffs too, which is pretty cool. Though in the mage tree, he gets a D rank, while in the, in the shaman tree, he gets a an E rank. And E rank is very limiting, so if you want Yuan's staffs to be good for something, I'd recommend going mage. Now, mage knight versus sage. Uh, I think it's over here, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's a matter of a mount versus a slight stat edge and light magic, which to me means mount pretty much every time. Uh, this also goes for loot, by the way, who of course starts off as a mage. Now, sometimes people make the argument that sage is better because light magic gives you weapon triangle over some monster classes, uh, like Gorgon and uh, Eyeballs. I'd say loot, high magic and access to Excalibur makes her plenty good against monsters of all kinds already. And light magic in general is weaker and therefore less useful, uh, especially against the human enemies. And as for a higher magic cap that Sage gives you over Mage Knight, even with her magic capped at 25, uh, just like Garcia and Ross, uh, Loot does enough damage to 2 hit kill most enemies. And Yuan has issues even reaching 25 magic before he caps his level. Uh, for creature campaign, neither of these characters are going to be very useful, but if you insist on using them, I guess Sage is better when they're all capped out. Now, comparing Druid to uh, Summoner is relevant for both Yuan and Null. <laughs> Null much. And for both of them, the verdict is about the same. Anima Magic doesn't do a whole lot for them, since uh, Flux is about as good as Thunder. I think it has the same might, or roughly the same might. Uh, but Summoning is a very useful skill. Uh, it summons a 1 HP Phantom with very variable stats, and they're pretty lackluster overall, and only useful as Cannon Fodder. Uh, Ewan's summons are a bit worse than Null's statistically, but that's generally irrelevant, since they're just meant to be Cannon Fodder. 
Uh, they can be used to bait long magic, like uh, long range magic, like Shadow Shot, since enemies love prioritizing them. Phantoms also ignore terrain like flyers do, and as a summoner both Ewan and Null find a purpose that doesn't involve them getting attacked, which is especially great for Null since his stats are, rather, <laughs> are pretty unimpressive, especially that zero luck of his. And this is also good for an underleveled Ewan, uh, which is exactly what it's going to be if you don't go out of, your, out of your way to grind him to be on par with your team. And out of all the trainees, uh, Ewan has probably the most interesting super trainee. Uh, super, pu super pupil <laughs> has access to all three types of magic, though he does enjoy, um, or does he does not enjoy having not having a crit bonus. Uh, he doesn't like not having a crit bonus. <laughs> he doesn't get it. he doesn't get one basically, and he also doesn't get sta staffs, uh, which kind of sucks. Uh, but just like the other super trainee classes, it's not as good as his main options since uh, weapon triangle control and magic just isn't as usual as use. <laughs> wow. Since weapon triangle control and magic just isn't as good as it is in weapons, but it's still pretty funny. So now that we've finally gotten Yuen, Loot and Null out of the way, there's still a couple of magic users with different promo paths that we haven't talked about yet. And I guess we'll go from top to bottom? Yeah, I think we will. So, uh, Troubadour is up first. First, <laughs> up first. Okay, first. La Rachel is the only Troubadour in FE8, and therefore she's the only one that has to suffer from having 6 movement compared to Priscilla and Clarine 7. She can promote into Valkyrie or Mage Knight, Valkyrie, whatever. And both of these also have one less move than you'd think they have, 7 instead of 8. Now confusingly enough, even though Valkyrie uses anima magic in FE6 and FE7, uh, in this game it uses light magic instead. And in this game Mage Knight is the anima ver using version of the Valkyrie. And it really comes down to whether you like uh, light or anima magic the most. Uh, in the Rachel's case it honestly doesn't really matter very much because she joins so unleveled it's hard to promote her. If you're promoting her very late into the game, it might be worth going Valkyrie over the Weapon Triangle uh, against monsters, but strictly speaking, she's better against anything not using Dark Magic as a Mage Knight. Uh, clerics also can promote into Valkyrie. Uh, this is where they like all start branching together. Okay, uh, Clerics can also promote into Valkyrie, or um, they can go Bishop. Um, this is about Natasha, by the way. She starts as a, as a Cleric. Uh, Bishop is a very interesting class in FE8 because it gets the Slayer skill. Uh, which gives you automatic effective damage versus all monster classes. Is this one skill that I think is worth passing up a mount for, especially when that mount only gives you one movement? Slayer is great late into the game and in the creature campaign, and uh, you know the difference isn't very big otherwise. And sadly, Natasha is very underleveled and her XP gain is super slow. Uh, but when you do get the chance to promote her at level ten, you should immediately go Bishop. And another nice thing about the Bishop is that it has a classy XP bonus. And Natasha actually levels up more quickly after promoting them before, which is kind of rare when you think about it, uh, since she can now fight enemies for EXP while still using staffs. Uh, Mulder the Priest and Arthur the Monk also have access to the awesome Bishop class, but their alternative class is uh, Sage instead of Valkyrie. Now overall Bishop is better and easier to use, especially for Mulder. The other reason to go Sage for him is to improve his combat against human enemies by using something like uh, Elfire, but um, Bishop offers a much bigger damage boost against monsters, it's also far superior in the creature campaign. Uh, Archer is a little bit more intricate, especially in LTC and efficiency settings. Sage's one advantage over Bishop is its higher magic cap of 28 uh, against 25, and a 28 magic Archer that manages to get to A staves is really helpful in a chapter like 20, uh, it actually can save you a turn, uh, but it's much harder to get him there since he only gets D staves and, um, if he promotes it to Sage rather than C as a Bishop. And unless you RNG abuse his magic, he's not going to reach 25 magic anyway. So for most people I would recommend Bishop, but if you want an Archer that can warp really far and enable one turn clears of a chapter like 16 or 20, you should give Sage a try. And that's really about it. Uh, thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me ramble about this for like 20 minutes. Hope it was useful to you. And I'll see you around. Give a like and subscribe if you want. See ya!